Hello, YouTube. So, scepticism. The way that uh, philosophers often talk about scepticism, at least external world scepticism, is in terms of sceptical hypotheses. Uh, so, the thought is that you know, the vast majority of people accept what we might call the common sense hypothesis or the external world hypothesis. Um, and this would be the claim that, you know, a whole bunch of material objects exist and these cause my perceptions and my, my perceptual data, um, generally speaking, is reliable at representing in terms of the representations it provides of the objects in the world. So like right now, you know, I am. I, I, I do in fact have a material body, and I am sitting in a room, and there's books over there, and I'm talking at a phone, um, etc. And you know there are people downstairs, and they have minds that are similar to my mind, and so on. Right. So this is this is the the common sense hypothesis, and then we can um, come up with a whole bunch of different skeptical hypotheses that we might use to challenge the justification for believing the common sense hypothesis. So there's, you know, well, well, maybe this is all just a dream. Like, maybe I'm dreaming right now. Um, how can I be sure that I'm not dreaming? How can I be sure that I'm not a brain in a vat? How can I be sure that I'm not being deceived by an evil demon? How can I be sure that I'm not in the matrix? Um, lots of different options there. Uh, so, so yeah, um, that's the way it's, it's usually framed. Now, you know, lots of uh, responses to skepticism. I've never found, well, I, I, I've never found the responses to, to this kind of skepticism particularly convincing. But, you know, one thing that strikes me about the way that we present this problem um, is that it, it seems to me that there's a perspective from which we might say that the common sense hypothesis is itself a skeptical hypothesis. So I think what a lot of philosophers you know, try to do is, you know, they'll, they'll try to sort of rule out sceptical hypotheses, um, you know, they'll, they'll sort of treat the common sense hypothesis as as the default hypothesis, right? And they'll try to show there's some sense in which sceptical hypotheses are illegitimate or, or, or whatever. I think that the common sense hypothesis, again, from a certain perspective, ends up looking like a sceptical hypothesis. So what, what do I mean by this? Well, imagine uh, a society that held very different beliefs. And we don't really need to imagine this actually, because you know we, it seems we can actually find societies in human history of people who held very different beliefs about how the world worked, right? So think about a society of, um, I guess you might call them Aristotelians. Uh, so in this society, um, everybody accepts a kind of teleological worldview where uh, everything develops in accordance with certain purposes and ends, um, all of the, events and processes and objects in the world are understood in teleological terms. They're understood in terms of, you know, things developing in accordance with a particular telos, right? So, um, so like this, this is a world, this is a society of people who just accept that we offer explanations in terms of final causes, in terms of ends, right? So you explain the development of, uh, so the development of something from like a seed to a tree is explained in terms of, you know, the end or the the telos of that particular organism, right? W whatever, right? So the point is, is that, you know, ordinary objects, right, are understood in teleological terms. Of course, that's not the case for our worldview. You know, we have arguably, um, arguably eliminated teleology at the very least, you know, we seem to have, have, have naturalized it. Um, I would say we've eliminated it, but in any case, we no longer take this to be explanatorily fundamental. Um, or consider uh, a world of people who are uh, sort of Barclayan idealists, right? Um, so as they see it, there are no material objects, right? Everything is mind, right? Everything is just fundamentally mind and everything is sustained by the mental activity of God. Um, and so they would say that they can literally see the activity of God in the operation of nature. I suppose it's kind of like how, you know, um, it, you know, even today, some people might say, like, I, I saw, you know, the activity of God when I looked at the beauty of the mountain, right? But for a world of Barclayan idealists, I mean, this is meant you know, really very, very literally, right? It's like the mind of God is literally what creates and sustains the existence of 
all of the objects we see around us. Objects are not understood as being material things, they're seen as being mental entities. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, you, so, so that's sort of, I guess you could, could kind of think of, of like a world of people who view things in, in teleological terms or a world of idealists, right? And then into this world, there comes a skeptic, right? Who offers a bunch of skeptical hypotheses. Um, they'll say, well, you know, how do you know that you're not a brain in a vat? How do you know you're not dreaming? How do you know that um, everything you see around you isn't just, you, you know, a sort of, you know, how do you, how do you know the world is it doesn't just consist of these blind material processes? How do you know it's not just atoms in the void? Um, of course, you know, these days we no longer believe that the world is literally just atoms in the void. But hopefully you get the point, right? Like the um, the common what we see as being the common sense hypothesis might well look from the point of view of you know a Barclayan idealist who. Uh, who has a kind of teleological view of nature, that might well look like a sceptical hypothesis. Um, you know, and, and you can kind of push this a bit further as well, actually, because even today we recognise that there is, in some sense, there's, well, there seems to be some sort of conflict between uh, the scientific worldview and the common sense worldview. You know, we think that perception is in some ways misleading. Um, so I guess it's a conflict between like the scientific image and the manifest image, as, as Seller put, as Sellers put it. Um, like the table in front of me uh, is mostly empty space, but of course that's not how my perception seems to represent it. Right? Science has revealed this world behind the phenomena that is very different from how it appears. So again, you know, you could sort of build that into. Um, again, when you when you uh, enter the world of the uh, the Aristotelians or the Barclayan idealists, you know, build that into your hypothesis as well. It's like um, the way that things appear are just completely different to uh, what they expect. So, um, so what's the point of this? Well, well, I'm I'm not sure, but it's. <laughs> Um, that seems to be the way with most of these videos, is uh, I'm, I'm not really sure what my point is, but what I would say is that it's interesting that we frame this, we sort of, we say, well, you know, there's this common sense hypothesis that we can take as the you know, kind of default position, right? And then, okay, that might be challenged by these sceptical hypotheses. Um, but I don't know, why shouldn't we say that the common sense hypothesis is itself a sceptical hypothesis? And uh, it just turns out to be a sceptical hypothesis that most people today have ended up accepting. Um, or maybe one way to put this, of course, is that there isn't just one external world hypothesis, there are many. And in the same way, you know, there's not just one sceptical hypothesis, there are many, right? Like there's, wait, well, how do I know this is not just a dream? How do I know I'm not a brain in a vat? How do I know I'm not in a matrix? How do I know I'm not being deceived by an evil demon? Um, you can come up with all of these different sceptical hypotheses. Uh, in the same way, there's a whole bunch of external world hypotheses. And from at least some perspective, some of these external world hypotheses look very much like sceptical hypotheses. Um, so, you know, it, maybe one way to uh, uh, ask this question is like, what exactly, what exactly counts as a sceptical hypothesis, right? Like, when, when do we say that something... Um, you know, what sort of conditions does it have to meet? I think there's a few different ways that we can look at this. Um, so, so one thing we might say is that a skeptical we have a skeptical hypothesis when, if the hypothesis is true, it would turn out that our view about the fundamental nature of reality is mistaken, um, like radically mistaken. Uh, and I think if we're understanding skeptical hypotheses in that way, then um, things like, you know, the matrix hypothesis, that's going to turn out to be a sceptical hypothesis because, you know, people assume that they're surrounded by these material objects, um, but actually it's just a, you know, it's just computation. Um, the, uh, that's, that's what's generated. They're not real material objects, they're virtual objects. Their fundamental nature is computational. Um, but then if, if that's what counts as a sceptical hypothesis, then it seems to me that the common sense hypothesis is basically a sceptical hypothesis as well. Um, I'm not sure uh, uh, what would be 
you know, I'm not sure if there's anything that would fail to be a skeptical hypothesis because there's so much, you know, disagreement throughout human history about what the fundamental nature of reality is like, uh, that any hypothesis which tells you anything about the fundamental nature of reality is going to turn out to be a skeptical hypothesis. You know, it's, it's, it's going to, it's going to be the case that if that is true, then most people's beliefs about the fundamental nature of reality are wrong. So an, alter, an alternative way of, of putting it, and I, I suppose this really gets to um, the point of skepticism, would be to say, well, as you have a skeptical hypothesis, if it shows, if the truth of that hypothesis would entail that most ordinary beliefs are false. Now, on that view, uh, the common sense hypothesis is not a skeptical hypothesis, because if it turns out that, you know, I'm, that th th there are lots of, uh, you know, material objects that cause my perceptions and perception is reliable at tracking difference, you know, tracking properties in the material environment and so on, then yeah, most of my ordinary beliefs are true. Uh, but I think it's also going to turn out to be the case that many of the things that we would tend to call skeptical hypotheses are actually not skeptical hypotheses. There's a really lovely article by David Chalmers called uh, The Matrix as Metaphysics. I think that's what it's called. And um, you know, he, he makes this point that, um, you know, so let's take the, the hypothesis that we're all living in the matrix. Well, why shouldn't we just say that the, ma that the matrix world is a real world, right? Um, so, like, we can still say that if we're in the matrix, it, se it seems like it's still going to be true to say that, you know, there are cars and trees and oceans and people and all of these things. It's just that the fundamental nature of these things is not what we thought it was, right? Like, okay, we thought that we were living in a world of material objects, right? But okay, it turns out we're wrong about that. Actually, these things are being, you know, gen they're, they're like computational, they're being generated by computational processes. Okay, but why does that mean that they're not real, right? Like, if it turns out that my hands are being generated by computational processes, wh why does that mean that I, that I don't have hands? I mean, why wouldn't I say, okay, yeah, okay, I have hands, it's just that my hands are being generated by something that, you know, I, something unexpected. Like, um, you know, I, I can discover surprising things about the underlying nature of reality. So one of the things we've discovered, which is, you know, surprising, uh, is that uh, hands consist of protons and electrons and neutrons and all of that, right? Well, nobody expected that. Um, you know, that, that, was a, that theory wasn't even conceived of. <laughs> Uh, 2,000 years ago. And of course, when you look at quantum phenomena, it behaves in all sorts of weird ways, you know, wave-particle duality and uh, all sorts of strange things going on there. Um, so it turns out that the fundamental nature of the world is not what we expected it to be. Um, but we don't conclude from this, oh, well, I have no hands. You know, when you discover, for instance, that, that these hands are mostly just empty space, uh, you don't say, oh, that means there's no hands. It means that the fundamental nature of hands or the, the sort of, you know, the reality behind the phenomena is not what you expected. So isn't that just what's happening in the case of, of the matrix? Um, and I find that quite, quite persuasive. Uh, it really isn't clear to me why we would conclude that it's, it's not, that it's like not real, right? Just because its nature is not what we thought it was. Uh, so if that's the case, then you know, actually on many of these sceptical hypotheses, or what we think of as sceptical hypotheses, most of our ordinary beliefs can still be true. Um, when I say I have two hands, uh, it doesn't make any difference whether or not like these are material objects or whether they are, you know, virtual hands generated by uh, computational processes. I still have two hands, right? <laughs> um, so, okay, if we think of the sceptical hypothesis as a hypothesis on which most of our ordinary beliefs are wrong, yeah, the common sense hypothesis isn't a sceptical hypothesis. But what is? You know, I mean, I guess uh, that Chalmers's point doesn't sort of, it doesn't apply to all sceptical hypotheses, right? 
So, you know, if the uh, if the evil demon hypothesis is right, you know, or or if I'm just dreaming right now, then that that would that would seem to entail that uh, at least a significant chunk of my beliefs, ordinary beliefs, are false. But like not all of them. I mean, so so one thing that if if for instance I'm dreaming, then um, I suppose it's going to be the case that nobody has any other minds, right? So uh, uh, like. Imagine if, if people just blink out of existence when you're not observing them. Uh, so it's it's just me uh, and there's nobody really with, with any other minds. And although I think that other people have minds like mine, actually they don't. Well, that's that's pretty significant, right? Like that, that means that I'm wrong about a, a whole sort of domain of things. Um, but even even if I am just dreaming, I mean, I think actually a lot of my ordinary beliefs can still be true. I mean, it's still not going to be like a global scepticism about the world. I can have true beliefs about what's happening in the dream. Um, you know, especially if, if it's the case that my whole life so far, like everything that I remember is a dream. Uh, why shouldn't I just say, yeah, I, I do have hands and I am surrounded by objects, but they're just dream objects. Right. Again, that, that seems... Uh, that seems reasonable to me. Where it does have consequences, like I say, it, it does have significant practical consequences, is with respect to things like my interactions with other people. Um, you know, if I can't, you know, if, if I'm, if I don't believe that other people have minds like mine, then that may well affect how I interact with them. So this brings us to a sort of third way of conceiving of what a, what a sceptical hypothesis can be, which is we might try to define sceptical hypotheses in sort of pragmatic terms or practical terms, um, we would say, you know, something counts as a sceptical hypothesis when it would make a significant practical difference. Uh, it would, where if it turns out to be true, it would like undermine my ability to live. It would undermine my ability to, you know, perform ordinary everyday actions. Um, now, if something like the Matrix hypothesis turns out to be true, doesn't seem to do that. Uh, if I discovered that I lived in the Matrix, I would, I'd, I'd be like, okay, that's intellectually interesting, but, you know, I'm gonna carry on doing all the same things I usually do. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't really make a practical difference. Uh, if you tell me that, you know, the chocolate cake that I'm enjoying isn't real, well, you know, so what? I, I still enjoy it. It's still, it's still tasty. Um, I don't really care <laughs> like, if it's if it's not real. Um, and if we're all in the matrix together, uh, then there are still other people, and I'll still feel that I have certain responsibilities to them, and so on. On the other hand, if it turns out that I'm just dreaming, well, you know that that maybe does make a difference. Um, it makes a difference in so far as. If, if if nobody has any other minds, then I don't think there would be any sort of moral constraints, or at least I wouldn't really recognise any constraints on my actions, for instance. It, it wouldn't matter. Um, so, you know, there are, there are many reasons why I don't just go out and mug people, right? I mean, so there are self-interested reasons. I, I, I don't want to get arrested and so on. Um, but at least one of the reasons is, you know, I don't want to impose that kind of suffering on other people. So... Um, you know, I don't want to sort of like violate their their bodily integrity, say, by uh, you know, being violent towards them. I don't want to deprive them of things that are valuable to them, etc. But all of that is based on assuming that they are sentient and rational and capable of you know feeling and thinking and and so on. Um, and if I was to give up on that, then uh, I, I certainly wouldn't feel that constraint. So that would make a difference. I don't know if it would be, you know, it wouldn't be catastrophic. I mean, I can imagine some sceptical uh, uh, hypotheses or sceptical views that maybe would be catastrophic. So if I was unable to make inductive inferences, for instance, then that, that would, it seems to me, be catastrophic. If I wasn't able to form any expectations about what the future would be like, then I... I would I wouldn't be able to act anymore. Um, I would yeah I would I would have no idea what to do if I if I had no idea right whether um, like you know opening that door will allow me to 
walk through the door or whether I will just drop dead, uh, whether it will, like, you know, or, or whether it will make the door explode. Um, if I had no idea about that, I, I don't think I would um, be able to do anything. So, uh, uh, so you know, that that would be so that's that's one sceptical sort, sort of view that would be catastrophic. But if we're just talking about external world scepticism, um, you know, if I think that I'm a dream, that I'm currently dreaming, well, you know, there are still regularities in dreams. Um, seems I can still make inductive inferences in dreams. So um, that's that's not so much a problem. Interestingly, you know, if we think about if we if we're sort of defining the sceptical hypothesis in terms of what makes a practical difference to my actions, I think there's there's actually an interesting respect here in which the common sense hypothesis is a sceptical hypothesis. Because one of the things that I've found is that there are certain contexts um, where I find it quite useful to give up my beliefs, um, or at least give up some beliefs about the way that the external world is. Um, so uh, a good example of this would be, you know, if I'm uh, entering like a, a, a a new situation, like a, a, a social situation with lots of people that I don't know. And, um, you know, I mean, this is something that we all face and that can be kind of awkward. I'm, I'm pretty introverted, right? Like I, uh, I, I've, I've never been the kind of person who's going to be the, the centre of the party. Uh, I quite like being on my own and I actually find uh, interacting with crowds of people very stressful. Uh, I never really know what to say. I, I suppose there's a worry that, you know, I don't know, you might sort of say the wrong thing, offend people. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what it is, but certainly, um, you know, I, I feel, I feel awkward very often in social situations. Now, one way that you, <laughs> that it's, that you can approach this though, is to kind of rehearse the skeptical arguments, you know, before entering the social situation in question, um, start rehearsing some philosophical arguments and uh, give up your beliefs in the external world and just say, you know, well, hey, maybe this is just a dream, right? In, in fact, you know what, I'm just going to act as if this is just a dream, as if these people are not real. Um, and when you do that, it's, it, it removes, it removes the problem. Um, and what that means is, is that in that particular context, um, you know, assuming that I'm just dreaming actually allows me to uh, act more efficiently. It allows me to get things done, right, uh, <laughs> much more effectively than I can if I uh, assume the common sense hypothesis, if I assume the external world hypothesis. Uh, so from that point of view, in that context, the external world hypothesis seems like a sceptical hypothesis. It's like, if I was to accept the external world hypothesis, if I was to really believe the external world hypothesis, um, where there's this right material world populated with individuals just like me um you know it would it would be kind of a shock it would reduce my ability to act efficiently uh it would be similar not to the same extent but kind of similar to giving up inductive inference um again no nowhere near the same extent right if i if i gave up inductive inference i would have you know no idea what to do but if I believe that there are other people just like me, well, you know, maybe it makes me feel a bit more awkward or whatever in certain situations. It's not a disaster, but even so, um, it has a negative consequence. So if we think of uh, sceptical hypotheses in terms of those hypotheses that, if true, you know, would have significant negative consequences, you know, practically, like in terms of one's behaviour, well, actually, there are contexts where the external world hypothesis or the common sense hypothesis seems like a sceptical hypothesis. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather believe that I'm just dreaming. Uh, I, I guess that uh, this might, you know, for a lot of people, maybe they wouldn't be able to do this because, you know, they don't find the uh, arguments for philosophical scepticism convincing. I've always thought that uh, the sceptical arguments, or at least some sceptical arguments, are basically watertight. And, um, you know, uh, I... I I guess this is a topic for another video, actually. But, um, you know, I, I will say I very often do believe in the external world. 
Um, but I don't really see that as a, something that can be given justification uh, in the sort of sense that philosophers often use that term. But anyway, as I say, that's, that's kind of a topic for another video. But what it does mean is it does sort of allow me to... Um, I, 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 I am in a position where I can very often just give up some of these beliefs uh, if it would be useful to me, for me to do so. And I find that sometimes it is. Sometimes it is useful for me to just assume that I'm dreaming or, uh, or, or I'm, you know, being deceived by an evil demon or something like that. Um, all right. That's it. Bye.